I remember my dad, even when we were, I think we were on our, our third top 10 record and he was still going well you know you need to know something else to fall back on you know you need to and i'm going dad i'm not falling back i'm right. staying in the music business. Right. i'm not going back i'm not going backwards have any of the well-known people that you've worked with left a memorable impression on you there's been a, a lot of them you know yeah uh, that stand out a great big beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day there's a great big beautiful tomorrow and tomorrow's just a dream away. hey everyone and welcome to another there encounter with some groovy moments from the past the we're visiting the 60s with host dick scopatoni whose pop group harper's bazaar had a hit record back then called feeling groovy He'll be talking with our guests about a decade that shaped a whole generation, not only with the most magnificent music ever made, but also the politics, protests, and pretty much everything that happened in the swing in 60s. So, Dick, who's on today's show? Thank you, John. We're going to visit some great memories today with the chart-topping 60s hits from the Buckinghams. Their original lead guitarist, Carl Giamarese, is here to tell us how it all began with their number one billboard hit, Kind of a Drag. They followed that with a string of hits, including Don't You Care and Hey Baby, They're Playing Our Song. Billboard magazine named them the most listened to band in America, and they went on to play The Ed Sullivan Show, The Smothers Brothers, Comedy Hour, and American Bandstand. Carl and the Buckinghams are still on the road today, and we'll talk with him about the 60s and where they are now in just a moment. From his first days as lead guitarist for a group called The Centuries, Carl Giamarisi has been at home on stage in Chicago teen clubs where he contributed his lead guitar and Beatles look to their sound. In 1965, WGN-TV sponsored a contest looking for a band to perform on an upcoming show. By that time, The Centuries had changed their name to The Pulsations, and they won the spot, but were quickly renamed again to the Buckinghams as a response to the wave of the British invasion sweeping the country. The journey of a lifetime began when Giamarisi watched their single, Kind of a Drag, soared to number one on the national charts in a matter of weeks. That one achievement would change his life forever, launching a four-decade career in the music industry. So, Carl Giamarisi, welcome to America's Oldies But Goodies. Well, it's thanks for having me on, Dick. I appreciate it. It was nice listening to that. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, brings just, back uh, memories. <laughs> memories uh, reminded me. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. You know, before we really get ramped up into what's going now, and particularly before we start talking about the kind of a drag years, can you uh-huh. go back uh, maybe just a little bit before that and just kind of bring us up to speed before you had the first hit record? What were you doing? Well, do you mean when you say before the first hit, kind of a drag, or yeah, uh, kind of before, uh, kind of a drag? What was going because, on? Because you know, when the group, uh, when the Buckinghams began, which you know, our first break was that uh, TV show, All Time Hits. You know, we were a cover band. We were playing all the dances and teen hops around Chicago, and 
built quite a following. We were the house band at a place called the Holiday Ballroom. Every Friday night, you know, we would play there. And then we kind of got discovered by the owner of the ballroom, Dan Bellock, and another guy, Carl Bonafetti, who became our manager. And, you know, Bellock, what he noticed was that, you know, people would, it was a dance, they would dance uh, like crazy when the band was playing, but whenever we played, everybody stopped and watched. Huh. So he says, wow, there's something different or special about these guys, you know. And then after we got the, uh, the, the record deal, I mean, after we got the TV show, All Time Hits, uh, and that exposure for 13 weeks, he got us a record deal with USA Records, a Chicago-based label, and it brought us into the old Chess Studios in, at uh, 2120 South Michigan Avenue, which, of course, was mainly known for a lot of great blues uh, players that recorded there, like Muddy Waters and Little Walter and Chuck Berry, and uh, even the Stones recorded there. And, and we, we sort of were, uh, you know, out of our element. We were a pop group doing uh, pop cover tunes, everything from the Beatles to James Brown. So we, we went in the studio and, and recorded what we knew, you know, covered songs. And, and we had a few Midwest hits uh, before Kind of a Drag, before we finally found Kind of a Drag. We did a, uh, an old James Brown song called I'll Go Crazy. And, you know, we were fortunate that we had radio stations like WLS and WCFL in Chicago. They would support local bands and they would put your, your, your records on a regular rotation. And so you got a lot of exposure, especially WLS was a 50,000-watt station, and uh, that helped a lot, you know. And Big-time station. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. You mentioned playing at, at that ballroom. I mean, it kind of reminds me of before we were Harper's Bazaar, we were called the Tiki's, and, and we played in Santa Cruz, California, at the Coconut Grove Ballroom every Friday night during the summer. And I think our show was maybe, let's call it 70% Beatles songs and, uh, what, 20% Beach Boys songs? So yeah. we were doing the same thing that you guys were doing. Yeah, uh, yeah Harper's Bazaar. It was a great feeling. Groovy was a great uh, record, and I, I like that recording of it. You know better than anything else. Oh and yeah, thank that, you. That was the biggest hit, right? Of yes, it was. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. You know, we we were just cutting these cover tunes back then. This is like 1966, mm -hmm. basically, and you know we we covered the Beatles song "I Call Your Name." And it was our producer, Bellock's idea to put horns uh, in the recording because our live show we didn't have horns. We we never played with horns. And he says, well, let's dress it up, you know, and and uh, and, and give it a horn sound. And the guy who wrote the arrangements on all the songs, and when we finally did kind of a drag, was the trombone player, Frank Tuzinski, was a trombone player, because our producer, Bellock, was a big band leader. And so he had a big band, and so he got his, his guys to play horns. Uh, with us before you actually had the hit and you were still in the uh having to watch your expenses time frame did you have horn players on stage with you no 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 we, yeah. we never we never used horns even after the big hits came and kind of a drag and don't you care and so forth we still didn't tour with horns you know those were the days when also nobody cared the girls were still screaming, you know, for, <laughs> right, you, know yeah. you couldn't hear yourself play, uh, yeah. you know, it was like the Beatles thing, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing the Beatles play in Chicago at Comiskey Park in 65, and I didn't hear one note, no. you know, through yeah. the whole show, you know, it was just crazy. So we, you know, we never toured, you know, now we hardly ever do a show without uh, horns. Um, it's, it's a rarity that we don't, you know, I just have my Chicago guys and then around the country I just have different horn sections that I tap on that I've got a staple of horn players all over the place and uh, we've got our charts and it works out but back then it was uh, just something we did for the records and uh, it, you know it worked out and so our beginnings were really covering these tunes and you know we'd, we'd get a lot of airplay like I said WLS I, I remember Paul Schaefer called me one time really you know and uh, said, because he lived up, and he's a Canadian, uh, lived up near Thunder Bay or something in Canada, and, and he said he used to listen to WLS at night, and he was very familiar with the Buckinghams even back then, you know, because, because of WLS yeah. radio. 
I know they were 50,000 watt. I don't think we could get them on the West Coast, but they were the, like one of the giant major stations in, uh, yeah. certainly in pop music in the 60s. Everybody knew who they were. You know, I got to tell you a quick story about WLS. We were on a, pl- a very short plane flight. Harper's was on a short plane flight. We had played in Pasadena at uh, Caltech, and we're flying back home to San Francisco late at night, midnight at night. And the plane was hijacked. And, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that our wow. manager had always told us, and he wasn't on the road with us, he said, but if you ever get in an accident or anything happens to you, before you call an ambulance, call me. Because <laughs> he was heavy into getting instant PR. Well, we called him from the airport, and within a matter of moments, as uh, the FBI released us to go out to the main uh, part of the airport, the all the banks of phones were ringing people were answering them and saying uh anybody from harper's bazaar here it's wls on the phone <laughs> so anyway uh, so our manager had his finally had his day when he yeah yeah well he, he knew what to do and he wanted to get you guys as much exposure as possible now we get to kind of a drag and did it take off like really fast or what was the how did oh. it happen well, once it was finally released, you know, because, uh, you know, we were we were looking for, we were, we were determined to find an original song, and at the time, nobody in the band was a songwriter, and so our manager, uh, Carl Bonifetti, uh, tapped on someone he knew, uh, Jim Holve, and his partner, Gary Beisbeer, uh, they, they were writers. Holve was in a band, a soul band called The Mob in Chicago, and uh, he was writing songs, but they didn't fit in with what the, his group was doing. They were doing more funk soul music. And so Carl contacted him and went over to his house, and, and Jim sat down that morning with his unplugged electric guitar, and, and Bonifetti held a microphone on a reel-to-reel tape player up to, the, to his voice and the guitar, and, and Jim just sang, strummed the song and sang it. Yeah, and he he brought it back to us, and we thought, well, it's kind of a catchy tune, you know, kind of a drag. So we we rehearsed it. Uh, I remember rehearsing in my parents' basement, uh, coming up with an arrangement for it. And uh, I remember my mother even coming down and saying, hey, you know, that's a catchy song. You know, it's huh. really a good tune. Yeah. So uh, next thing we knew, we were back at uh, U.S. I'm um, back at uh, in the studio at at uh, the Chess Studios recorded the song uh, Belloc came up with the horn arrangement that that uh, crazy intro you know that you know it sounds like a very regal beginning to a song you know and then you know it's a, it's a strange song because it doesn't really have your normal you know verses and choruses and bridge and so forth I mean it starts right out kind of a drag you know and you're 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 right there that's the whole hook of the song and for, for whatever reason, USA Records, they didn't release it right away, and we kept bugging them to, come on, get to put the song out there, and I think a couple months went by, and, and they just hadn't released it yet, and finally, they, they released it, and oh my God, it took off overnight, I mean, it just, it started in the Midwest, and of course, the Chicago stations picked up on it, and they got airplay right away, and then I think their first national market was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, just one by one, it was just caught on like wildfire around yeah. the country. Yeah, that must have been, I'm, I'm sure it was exciting, because all of a sudden you were shifting from unknowns into very much knowns and watching the record climb the charts. It was a little scary, you know. I mean, we were a Midwest group who was, play, you know, we'd go out. I was the youngest guy in the band. The guys would pick me up uh after school on, on a Friday, you know, uh, and we'd all pile into a van that we had with all our equipment and lay on top of the equipment, and we would drive as far as, uh, you know, somewhere in upper Wisconsin or even, I remember once in Aberdeen, South Dakota, we, we, we did a date, and we, we'd play and then drive back right away and go back to school on Monday. And Were your folks uh, into what you were doing? Yeah, they were a little worried about you know because uh I'll, I'll admit my my grades really went down in my senior year in, in high school because uh, <laughs> with all the distraction you yeah. know and uh and they were concerned and you know i remember my dad even when we were i think we were on our our third 
top ten record, and he was still going. Well, you know, you need to know something else to fall back on. You know, you need. To, and I'm going, Dad. I'm not falling back. I'm right. staying in the music business. Right. I'm, I'm not going back. I'm not going backwards. Have any of the well-known people that you've worked with left a memorable impression on you? There's been a, a lot of them. You know, yeah, uh, that stand out. You know, and going back, you know, we play quite often with uh, Peter Noon. You know. Herman's Hermits and you know the, some of the acts that really leave an impression on me is uh, Peter Noon is one and and the late uh, Paul Revere uh, and even uh, Mark and Howard is Flo and Eddie from the Turtles sure. you know, and the reason is because okay musically the quality is there but they go beyond that they're they're uh, just unbelievable entertainers you know they they have that special element which is uh, something I always look up to and, and can appreciate when they connect with an audience and there's humor there. There's a lot more of a connection with the audience than just playing your songs. We try to do that too, but uh, not quite on uh, the, the level they do when it comes to that stuff, you know, and, it, and it's, I always look up to that. And, you know, through the years, we've worked with a lot of great entertainers. I mean, I remember in 67 doing the Gene Pitney tour. Okay. Gene was a great singer, you know, and great entertainer. And, you know, Neil Diamond back in the 60s when he was pretty much on the same level as we were. And then he turned into a superstar, you know, mm -hmm. and a uh, great songwriter, too, you know. And that was somebody that I look up to. I mean, I remember playing shows with the, with the Who, and they were pretty crazy guys. And briefly met John Lennon at Lou Adler's uh, Christmas party. Really? That was uh, very special. And, you know, there, there were just so many different people through the years that, uh, you know, that flashed through my mind now. You could just imagine over 50 years, there's been so many. Let's take a brief moment to listen to a familiar tune. We'll be right back. Every night I sit here by my window, window. Staring at lonely avenue, avenue Watching lovers holding hands and laughing, laughing And thinking about the things we used to do Making up things Like a walk in the park things. Like a kiss in the dark like a sailboat ride What about the night we cried Things like a lover's vow Things that we don't do now Thinking about the things we used to do Memories are all I have to cling to we're very fortunate for one thing to hit, still have uh, the baby boomers want to hear our music and uh, they want to hear their songs and they still come out and uh, and they're very you know they're very in tune with the, the songs and and the response has been great and and you know we're we're very personable and and you know you get that feeling that well, first of all, when you're doing the show, you know, just by the applause and the response from what you say and so forth. But then afterwards, one of the fun things for me and really means a lot to me is when we do the autographs afterwards. Oh, get yeah. Get merchandise out there. And, mm -hmm. and, and when the lines are so long, like they just were when we were in New Jersey, and most of the dates we do where the people are lined up, they want your CDs, they want to talk to you, they want to share their memories from you know they'll say well when don't you care came out i was you know i just met my wife or i just you know or kind of a drag i broke up with my girl you know they all have uh, some kind of connection with your songs and you know what what's a greater uh, tribute to your music oh than yeah having people remember i mean i do the same thing i i, I hear a great song on uh, on the radio and you immediately remember you know I, I hear feeling groovy on the radio and right away it reminds me of uh, where I was at at that time and what I was doing instant flashback yeah. that's the yeah. fun thing about music is it transports you instantly to a time you normally wouldn't th have even thought about if that song hadn't been playing on the radio or wherever you're listening to it on right, right. but you know in spite of all of our successes and you guys certainly had quite a few uh there was probably a few hills that uh we couldn't climb can you give me your best 
failure story, or do you even have one that you can think of? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's always ups and downs uh, through the years, uh, things that you wish, uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, some failures with songs we recorded, for one thing. Uh, the next song we recorded after uh, so much success for, for quite a while, it, you know, after, because Susan was a, a big success, it was a top 10 or top 12 record and then the next thing we we tried a song that our keyboard player marty greb wrote uh called uh back in love again and uh that was a failure that huh. uh it, it it uh i don't think it made it to 50 on the chart and uh that was a big disappointment you know and then we tried several other songs and there were some changes in the group and there was a song that I really thought was a great recording and a great song called It's a Beautiful Day, and that was a failure. But you know what? There's a lot of things you can attribute to that because the music scene was changing drastically at that point. I mean, it seems like overnight we went from AM to FM radio, and, uh, and then more of the heavier underground groups were coming in, and you had Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and Cream and, and uh, groups like us and... You know, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap and even the Beach Boys and, you know, the more pop groups and the Turtles, you know, were kind of being pushed aside to some degree. And it was just harder to get the exposure at that point. So those, you know, some of those recordings and those failures uh, kind of hurt, you know, because especially after you, you got used to uh, all the success so quickly. And and then uh, one of the, the biggest disappointments in my life was after the Buckinghams uh, broke up in about 1970, uh, the original group, I uh, was becoming more of a singer-songwriter, and I, I paired with another original Buckingham, uh, Dennis Tufano, and uh, we, we formed a duo. First we were Dennis and Carl, and we were playing clubs again around Chicago and trying to play venues to expose original music. Uh, there were some clubs that allowed you to play original songs, and we were trying to get that going, and we were cutting some demos, and we, we got turned down by uh, several labels uh, at that point. And then finally, uh, at the time, uh, our original drummer, John Polis, was managing us, and he contacted the great Lou Adler, the producer uh, who also had his own label, Ode Records, which was part of A&M at the time. And this mm -hmm. is now, now we're talking about 1972. And so we did a demo, uh, Tufano and I, in Chicago at RCA. And one of the songs we did was a song I wrote called Music Everywhere. And so we did this demo, and as a backup group, we used some of the guys from the group called Poco. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, Timothy B. Schmidt was the bass player on that who wound up as part of the Eagles mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So, we, you know, we did the demo and he sent it to Lou Adler. And I don't know how he got Lou to listen to it, but Lou heard it and he says, great, I want to sign him. Ah. Just like that. And, you know, Lou Adler at the time, he just won, you know, he just had seven Grammy Awards. Sure. <laughs> Carol King's uh, album, Tapestry. Uh, which was on Ode, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were pretty excited about that, and, you know, he wanted to produce it, too, and so we went out to L.A. and, and played our whole repertoire of songs and did an album with him. I think we had a three-album deal with him and did the album, and he released that song, Music Everywhere, as uh, the single, and we were expecting great things. You know, here we are with Lou Adler on Ode Records, and uh, he changed our name too, to from Dennis and Carl to Tufano and Jim Reese, okay. which was a mouthful. <laughs> you know, right. and we were thinking, "Wow, <laughs> how are people going to say that?" You know, yeah. I mean, that's not an easy one. So, you know, the album came out. It got a lot of exposure. That song got a lot of airplay, and because he was Lou Adler and Oak Records, but it wasn't a hit. It, it just it moved up the charts slowly, and it never got past fifty. I don't think. And about the same time, uh, the Doobie Brothers released uh, Listen to the Music, mm -hmm. that song. They were new, too. And yeah. there was a lot of similarity there. And I think that might have hurt us a little bit. It, it was a great opportunity. We spent uh, quite a bit of time out in L.A., and we, we recorded uh, three albums with, with Ode. And kind of uh, Dennis uh, Tufano and I had some ups and downs uh, in our relationship, but we, we were trying to make it happen. 
And uh, it was a great experience. We recorded with some of the great musicians in L.A. at the time. That was a, that was a real uh, opportunity for us. Like I said, a great experience. And we were, uh, Lou wanted to stick with us as songwriters, but we just weren't writing the hits. And we did three albums and over the course of seven years and couldn't, couldn't get a hit. And that was, that was a major disappointment for me. I'm sure it was. And, you know, I'll tell you, for uh, people that don't do this regularly probably wouldn't understand. But I, I know I've had a few occasions in my life when either I've written a song or recorded a song where personally this has been my number one best thing hands down that I've ever done and uh, you play it for people and you get that blank stare look <laughs> and yeah. you're thinking to yourself oh, yeah. I couldn't top this this is the best I've done and yet nothing nothing comes nothing. back so oh, it, it happens even today I mean I still I love writing I love recording you know I did uh, in a few years back I did an album for the Buckinghams called reaching back and uh you know i had a lot of people asking me well why don't you record go back to your buckingham sound with those melodic chord changes and symphonic chords and sounds and and so forth but with some new songs so uh, little by little i started writing and writing and all of a sudden i had a whole collection of enough to put on an album and we did this album and i was really proud of it and i thought wow this is this is going to be great maybe we'll get a hit again and then nothing because well for one thing we didn't have the promotional budget that somebody like uh you know a sony records or sure has yeah and uh we were pretty much doing it ourselves I, I licensed it with a small label called fuel which is a west coast uh, west coast label and um they put it out there but what we found out soon was that First of all, you know, the, the, the audience that buys music now, and especially downloads and streaming, uh, is a young audience, like it always was. Yeah. And, and our, our baby boomers, they don't buy new music. They want to hear the old songs. You know, you're the, uh, probably the 10th person that I've talked to of all the various people I interviewed that has said that. I think it's an affliction that, I mean, I can look at my list here. The Safaris, the Standells, Joey D, the Letterman. The list goes on and on and on. They all say the same thing. Yeah, well, we all, and we've all talked about it together, yeah. too. You yeah. know, I've been with a lot of those guys, and, you know, the Letterman. You know, we, we did a cruise with them not too long ago. I remember talking to Bobby from the Letterman. Mm -hmm. We talked because he's always writing and very creative guy and does some great things. But, you know, you can't. It's very frustrating because you, you just can't seem to get. Uh, you know, I did a solo album called Living in the Moment uh, about six months ago and was excited about it. And I just put it out there as a download streaming album it's on iTunes and a lot of different uh, websites, Amazon and. And I get, you know, orders trickle in and you get down, you know, people find it and you sell a little bit, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's nothing compared to, uh, you know, how many records, uh, or downloads someone like, uh, Justin Bieber or sure. Taylor Swift is, <laughs> right. is selling, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's a drop in the bucket. You sure. Know? So it's, it's, you know, that's frustrating, but you know, I, I do it now. I write and, and do new music because, uh, I just need to be creative and do do that. You know, it's a it's a release for me. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we still do it, and I don't try to do it on a, in our show in the Buckinghams. I don't really do any uh, new music and new songs because people don't respond enough to it. If it's you know, if I go see Paul McCartney in concert, uh, you know, I want to hear the Beatles song. Yeah, I don't want to hear his, the song that he just wrote. That's right. You know, a month ago, you know. That's universal, I think. And I want to ask you about a, a venue that I think may be somewhere near you. Uh, and I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit way back to, I'm going to get to maybe 1958, somewhere in there. I was a real fan of the Kingston Trio, and that's how I kind of came up through the ranks, was playing folk music. And I remember on one of their albums, on the back of the album, I don't remember the name of the album, there was a small picture, black and white picture of them playing at the Ravinia Music Festival. Festival, which oh, yeah. I I think isn't aren't you somewhere near that? Well, I used to be li I used to live very close to it. I lived on the North Shore, in a, and I used to go there just as a customer all the time when my wife and I lived in the area, and we'd go there just you know it's one of those uh, venues where you have a pavilion 
you can buy tickets to the pavilion and uh, like a, you know a regular concert and be right by the stage and it's a beautiful setting or you can sit out on the lawn yeah that's right and, and it's it's very popular for people to bring their you know dinner and and, mm-hmm. and wine and and you, you'll see people uh, just sitting out there in their shorts on the lawn on a blanket and then you'll see other people uh, with tables and white tablecloths dressed formally yeah. with with candles <laughs> and eating dinner. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a mix like that. It sounds a little bit like near us here near Santa Cruz over the hill actually is uh, Shoreline Amphitheater. Same kind of thing where everybody sits outside. But what was interesting about the Ravinia Music Festival, I always had starry eyes for anybody that was famous when I was a kid playing folk music on my guitar. And I I see this picture of the Kingston Trio. Fast forward about maybe 10 years from that time, and here we are as Harper's Bazaar playing at the Ravinia Music Festival. So that would be one of those cases where dreams do come true. <laughs> so, well, I have a memory for from that, uh, in, it was I remember it was the summer in July, and we played. And this was in I want to say the early '90s. It was a big show. We played with um, uh, I forget how many acts. I believe the Turtles were on that show. The MC of the show we did was Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, geez! And nobody knew who Jerry Seinfeld was at the time. And, uh, you know, he, he did, the Seinfeld uh, show, the TV show, hadn't come out yet, you know, and he was just sort of an unknown comedian, uh, or not that well known anyway. And he was the MC and introduced the acts. And I remember him standing out at the back door of the Pavilion Theater and looking out and looking at all the, uh, all the women out there and go, wow, oh, look at that one, look at her, <laughs> you know, and he's, he was like, uh, checking out the, yeah. you know, everybody <laughs> but uh you know and i and it was a very successful show and it was just packed you know as i get older i think more about my philosophy of life which is a pretty big question now but wasn't even in my thinking back in my 20s would you be up for sharing some of the wisdom including spiritual wisdom if you want that you've gained over the years of course you know i was brought up being Italian, brought up a Catholic. Of course, we all were. were and, yeah, uh, and never questioned, uh, you know, the, my religion and the church. And, and I, of course, you know, grew a little more uh, questioning through the years. And, and I'm still spiritual, but maybe not quite. You know, I, I just I still have a lot of questions. You know, yeah, question. And uh, I, you know, I believe in God, of course, and that there's something out there. Uh, after you know, sometimes I, I go back and forth from being very fearful, being you know that life is uh, passing now, and, and you know you've reached a certain age when you know there's a lot more years behind you than there were in front of you, and uh, it's a little scary. And then at other times, I actually get excited about it because you're curious to know what's beyond and what's there, you know. But one of the things that and my wife always reminds me because I, I could be, you know, life has been really good to me, and I, I love living. And I, I I hate the thought of the day when, uh, you know, either uh, you you know when it's over, yeah. or even when you're incapacitated to a point where you can't uh, function like you used to. That's that's a little scary too. But I try real hard to live in the moment now. And uh, as I mentioned, I did an album not too long ago called Living in the Moment. And my wife's always like when I get down about something or I start thinking too much about the past or worrying about the future. It's like, come on, you know, live in the moment. You know, yeah. You're letting you're letting the time pass that you have right now because you're you're you you're you're bothered too much by you're thinking about the, that, you know, the, the future and and. You know, that's something I, I don't want to do. So I, I'm not like this real spiritual person, but, uh, you know, I'm just trying to uh, enjoy what I have right now and, and live in the moment. And it's not easy. Well, it's not. And you've got so many memories, so many good memories. And there's also the down memories, too. But I think your wife's tapped into it with the living in the moment. I really like that. And as you say, it's not easy. You know what's not easy? 
to remember that philosophy to live in the moment. There are yes. times I know when I'm down, that philosophy doesn't cross my mind at all. I've completely forgotten about it. But, you know, your wife, I think, is probably tuned in to your down days and your up days, and, and she can right. spot and that. I, and I, I'm, I'm a worrier to an extent, you know, and, you know, I, I worry about stuff, and I'm I'm very, uh, I like things to be just so and very organized and, um, you know, and, and I, I need to be uh, a little more just looser about it mm-hmm. and, and enjoy. And I, you know, and I mean, I enjoy myself now, but, uh, but you know, I, I find myself thinking about it more often about uh, what's beyond, you know, and, yeah. and so forth. And sure. I think you can't help that when you, as I mentioned, I'm approaching 70 and and I've I've been very fortunate that I'm have good health and everything, but uh, but you can't you know that that I think is important when you reach this point in your life is to enjoy everything around you that's going on in the moment and not think so much about the future. You know, and the past you can't help. I mean, it's you know especially uh, Dick the, the nature of what we do, what I do now. You're constantly being reminded. Of course, of the past because yeah. of who you were and who you are and performing and you know when people bring uh, photos to a show uh, from back in the '60s, it, it seems like another lifetime to me. I don't think because I look at that 19 year old kid and and okay, you know, okay, that was me, whatever, you know. But but when they bring photos from a show they were at say 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and I look at it and I go, wow. I'm aging. (laughs) I look a lot older now. You know, that's where you you see it. You know, you see the difference from 10, 15, even 20 years ago. And that seems like it just happened the other day. You know, I mean, it's 10 10 years ago. 10 years go by, it went by really quick. Well, you know, speaking of of now, now that we're talking about now, what are you doing now? What's coming up in the near future for you? I see by the old clock on the wall, it's time for a quick break. We'll be back in less than a minute. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean the bare necessities or Mother Nature's recipes that bring the bare necessities of life. Wherever I wander, wherever I roam, I couldn't be found off my big home. The bees are buzzing in the tree to make some honey just for me. When you look under the rocks and plants and take a glance at the fancy ants, then maybe try a few. The bare necessities of life will come to you. They'll come to you. Well, what I'm doing now is... uh... For one thing, we continue playing, performing. I have a, a full schedule. As, well, full for me. You know, I don't. Um, I don't try to play as many dates as we we used to because I do want to enjoy life and do things more and take some vacations. And you know, my my wife and I are talking about uh, uh, going to Italy you know, oh, for yeah. a vacation, mm-hmm. and uh, and I try to play a little more. Uh, you know, golf, and uh, you know, I used to play a lot of tennis. I don't do that too much anymore. And you know, get out, have some nice dinners, uh, go to a movie, whatever. Put some space between the shows. I don't like to go out, play so many days in a row. You know, I, I like it now where we go out on a weekend and then don't go out again till the next weekend. And we're down to about maybe forty dates a year right now. And that's, uh, you know, that's even, you know, I don't that's care a lot. it winds up being 20 or 25 or 30, you know, it, it's fine with me. I, I've come to realize that, hey, I've got to just, you know, smell the roses now and just uh, relax a little bit more and enjoy spending some time with family. And, you know, I never had any children, but I have, you know, my sister and brother and my nieces and nephews and, and uh, friends that uh, you want to get together with more often. And so, you know, you, you reach that point in your life where you want want to enjoy those things a little bit more. And then by playing less dates, when you do perform, I think you enjoy it even more because it's not that hectic, crazy pace that you've been doing. And uh, uh, 
and the, each each date that we perform uh, means more to us, you know. Yeah, I would think so. Particularly if you're able to just do weekends, which which gives you the week at home and all of the things that you're talking about doing. Have you been to Italy before? I have not. I have, which is uh, surprising. At my, I don't know why it, it eluded me. I've been to Europe. I've been all through England and uh, France and. You know, Belgium, Holland, different places. And for some reason, I, I just haven't gotten to Italy. Do you know if you've got any family anywhere in Italy? Well, I've been told by uh, some relatives that some Giamarisi's G- are still, uh, uh, you know, I'm Sicilian, actually. You know? Okay. So down in Sicily, near a little town near uh, Palermo, uh, there's still some Giamarisi's there. And I would love to... Uh, travel down there and uh if you could make that connection we did make a connection and my let's see on my mother's side a little town near pisa on my father's side a little town near naples we never made it south of rome to the naples area but we made it to my mother's side and those relatives uh, just meeting them uh, were the best they have since come over and stayed with us and we've gone back and stayed with them it's a real trip to be to be able to do that so if there's any way you can even put out a feeler for possible connections over there and then go visit them i i think it would be a, i think you'd really have a ball doing it yeah i keep telling myself too i i don't <clears throat> i don't speak italian uh i can understand it a little bit and i wasn't uh, I, I could understand it uh, fairly well when i was a little kid when my grandmother lived with us and she would speak italian you know and my folks did too but i keep saying i'm going to take a course and see if i can grab it and pick up enough uh that would uh, help me while I was there. And you know, uh, one thing you'll find, I did that a couple of times. The only drawback is, and I did it in anticipation of going over to Italy, but the drawback is that if you don't continue doing it, you lose it after like two weeks. It's just, you just lose it. So yeah. uh, the farthest I ever made it from Berlitz was... Um, Una tavola per due per piacere, which is a table for two, please. I uh, never did get beyond that. But, you know, meeting the relatives for us, there always seemed to be one person in the group that spoke enough English that they, they sort of acted as the translator. And that's what oh, got us through. Yeah, so, yeah. at any oh, rate. That's, that's, that's good. You know. Well, you know what? I want to check back with you maybe in six months or so, because I'm going to be curious to see if you if you put the Italy trip into the planning phase yeah. Uh, yeah. or if in fact you go then i want to hear all about the trip but i have to tell you it's uh, really been enjoyable just talking with you and hearing all about uh, all the stuff you've been through yeah well it's you know it, it's been a great life i can't i don't have any bitterness i, I have a, a you know a, a few in in the business that i know that uh, people i know that are bitter about certain things but i, I don't really yeah, there's been ups and downs, and, you know, we've had managers that ripped us off and, you know, and different uh, things that happened, like everybody, you know, sure. it's, it's, you know, we didn't realize the uh, the importance of owning publishing and writing and somebody else got rich and, you know, but I, I don't have, hey, the, the music business has been good to me. I've, I've always been able to make a living, a good living from it, and I can't complain. I've never had to do anything else. By the way, I'm a big sports fan. I'm a tremendous Cubs fan and and Bears fan here in Chicago. And and I I just recently recorded a song that was written uh, that we put together for the Cubs called uh, you know Chicago Cub Family you know Fly the W. And it's I worked on it with a fabulous musician and drummer. Uh, his name is Joe Vitelli, another uh, paisan. Yeah. And Joe is the drummer for uh, Joe Walsh. Oh, yeah. And Joe also played many years ago. He started with Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and he was a drummer for the Eagles. And um, and he's with Joe Walsh. He has been for many years. And, and so him and I connected and recorded this song, and we're trying to get the Cubs to use it now, and, and it's starting to get some exposure. There was a, an article about it in the Chicago Tribune today, 
So that's you know a little side project, you know. And Boy, that, if you could if band. you could get them to connect and have you recorded the song, is it is it ready yeah. to play? Okay. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It's it's already out there. It's on iTunes and Amazon. What's the I, title? I, uh, the title is Chicago Cub Family, and Fly the W is uh, you know the big hook in the song you know and that would really be neat if uh, you know i think here of course we got the san francisco giants which this year is really not their year but uh yeah. we go we try to go to maybe one or two uh giants games and of course at the end of the game it's a uh, constant i left my heart in san francisco you hear tony bennett singing as you're oh, yeah. exiting the stadium so i think it'd be great if you could connect with that uh tune yeah, yeah. Well, the Cubs are, you know, I mean, they've had their recent, well, of course, you know, the, that was probably the biggest sports story sure. uh, in oh, the yeah. many years with them winning the World Series. You know, it's, this town was absolutely, went crazy. You know, and <laughs> Jeez. and the, the parade afterwards, uh, I mean, there was over a million people showed up. And, wow. And it's, it's just, uh, the, the, the craziness was just unbelievable. Yeah. And they're doing good this year, you know, since the All-Star break. They've had a very winning record, and, you know, I'm, we're confident they'll be back in the playoffs. I don't... I don't. I don't see them winning the World Series again. But uh, well, listen uh, again. I have to say thank you. Uh, great interview, and uh, we shall be in touch again. And maybe the next time I talk to you, I'll be hearing more about uh, Sicily and a possible trip. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Sounds great, Dick. It was a pleasure meeting you, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. You're you're more than welcome. Anytime if we ever get out that way, maybe you come to a Buckingham show. Oh, uh, if you think about coming to the West Coast, Northern California, San Fran, San Jose, anywhere around there, um, please, if you can remember, let me know. I will. All righty. Well, sounds good. Thanks, Carl. Okay. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate it. You take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Until next week, keep your face in a smile. It makes everything worthwhile. Bye-bye. You've been listening to America's Oldies But Goodies with Dick Scapatoni. Join us again next week for more memories from the good old days. In the words of Jerry Garcia, what a long, strange trip it was. The Swingin' 60s. I'm John Berg. See you then.